In this video, we're going to learn about the average value of a function. Now, let's review uh, the more basic notion of what it means to take the average or mean of a collection of numbers. So if you had n numbers, x1 through xn, then we define the average or the mean of this collection to be the quantity 1 over n times the sum of all of these numbers. Or if we use sigma notation, we might say it's 1 over n times sigma k equals 1 to n of x sub k. We often use a bar over a variable name to indicate a, an average of a collection of numbers, so in this case we might use x bar. Let's just look at a simple example. Suppose you post quiz scores of 70, 75, 80, and 95. Then what's the average quiz score? So what we'll do is we'll add together the four quiz scores and then divide by four. In other words, your average quiz score is one-fourth times the sum of the four quiz scores, which in this case turns out to be about 80. So let's look at another example. The high temperatures on Friday and Saturday are 28 and 30. What must the high temperature be on Sunday to yield a three-day average high of 32 degrees? So let's let the unknown uh, temperature, high temperature on Sunday be called T. We'd be looking for a solution to this equation because you'd want to average the three high temperatures, 28, 30, and T, the one we don't know yet, take that average, and then we want the average to equal 32. Well, if you work this out, you find out that the temperature, a uh, high temperature on Sunday had better be 38 for the three-day high temperature to be 32. All right, let's look at a more graphical example. What is the average height of this collection of rectangles? So the heights are 3.6, 4, and 2. Well, the average height is clearly going to be what you get by adding these three heights and dividing by 3. In that case, it's 3.2. Now, we want to explore this example a little further to see some geometric meaning and what an average really is. So if we take a copy of these three rectangles over here, we'll notice that the average is exactly what you get if you were to sort of redistribute all the heights evenly across the three rectangles. You would get three rectangles, all of which have height 3.2. So that notion, that sort of redistributed height, that's going to come in handy for what we're about to see when we try to find out what we mean by the average value of a function on an interval. So here we go. Let's set the stage. Suppose f is a continuous function defined on the closed interval a to b. Our goal is to make sense of the idea of the average value of f on the interval. So let's get a quick graph of our function. So we've assumed it's continuous. And actually, for this derivation, we're going to assume that the function's non-negative. We're going to assume that the graph lies totally above the horizontal axis. Now, if you choose an x in the interval from a to b, then you get a function value. And we can think of this function value as representing a height. So when we look for an average value of a function, in this context, at least when the function value is non-negative, we can imagine that we're finding an average height of the graph. Let's keep that in mind as we work our way through derivation A, or what we might call the wave tank derivation. We're going to imagine that our function defines the top of a wave inside of a tank. And what we're going to do is we're going to let that water settle down. And when it's done, settling down, we'll get a rectangular area of water. Of course, the area won't change, assuming nothing's leaking out of the box. And finding the area of a rectangle is very easy. We can just take the product of the width and the height. And we'll notice that the height we get, we can interpret as the average height on the left, because that's the height we would get if it's sort of this body of water sort of redistribute itself equally across the width of the interval. All we need to do is calculate the width w in the area a, and then we'll be able to calculate the average height. And this average height is what we're thinking of as the average value of the function on the interval. Now, the value of w, the width, is simply b minus a. It's the width of the interval. And the value of a we can actually calculate because we know that the definite integral gives a signed area. So the average value of f on the interval from a to b turns out to be given by this formula, 1 over b minus a times the definite integral of f on the interval from a to b. And that is indeed what the definition of average value of a function on an interval is defined to be.
Please note that this wave tank derivation is intuitively compelling, but it's got a problem, and that is that the function value really had to be non-negative for us to literally see the function graph as a wave top. It's not going to make much sense when the function value is negative. So what we'd really like to do is come up with a different derivation that leads to the same place, but is a little more rigorous. And that's going to lead us to derivation b through Riemann sums. So let's take our function to have negative values in this case. So given a, an x in the right place, our function value could be negative. And you can see then that it is not very clear what, would you, what you would mean to, if, you, if you tried to describe this as the profile of a wave that needed to even out. Because signed area is a tricky thing to imagine. Certainly, it's uh, harder to imagine what you might mean by the profile of a wave in this situation. So we're going to have to come up with a different way of handling our definition of average value in this case. Uh, we're going to need a different sort of motivation. So let's try this. Let's break the interval into some number of pieces, in this case, six pieces. And then we'll take the midpoint of each of those six subintervals, and we'll sample the function value at each of those six um, locations. And we know what it means to average six numbers, so that's exactly what we'll do. We'll just take the average of those six function values, and, and that should give us an approximation of the average value of f on the whole interval. Now, what could we do to get a better approximation? Well, presumably what we could do is we could chop up the interval into more pieces. So you could have n pieces quite generally, and you just could sample the midpoint of each of the intervals and take the average of all those function values, and hopefully that would even be a better approximation. Let's put this in sigma notation. So we're going to have uh, this being a, an approximation for what we're thinking of as the average value of f on the whole interval. So we're sort of sampling equally by subdividing the interval from a to b into equal subdivisions and then picking the midpoint from each of those those subintervals and sampling the function value at each of those locations, you'll get just a finite collection of numbers and we can just take the average. Now, hopefully this notation is already suggesting to you that there's a Riemann sum lurking about. So let's give the name delta x to the common width of all these subintervals we've chosen. In other words, it's b minus a over n. And we're going to take our expression for the approximation of the average value, and we're going to multiply by b minus a over b minus a, which of course is a fancy way of writing 1. So we haven't changed the value of the sum, but what we're going to do is use this expression to sort of clean things up. We're going to multiply the numerator b minus a into the expression. We're going to distribute that across all the different sum ands. We're going to take the denominator b minus a and just slide that in front. And so what we get is an expression that looks like this. It's 1 over b minus a times the sum of x, f of x k star times b minus a over n. And of course, this delta x is uh, what we're calling b minus a over n, so we could replace that inside the sum. And now you can see that we've got a Riemann sum, a midpoint sum, in fact. And then we've weighted it by multiplying by 1 over b minus a. Presumably, by increasing the value of n, we'll get better approximations for the average value of f. It stands to reason that if greater values of n give you better approximations to the average value, then perhaps what we should do is simply define the average value of f to be the limiting value as n goes to infinity. And indeed, that's what we'll do. And we'll notice that when we actually try to understand what this limit is, well, first of all, there's a limit law that allows us to pull the factor 1 over b minus a out. And then what's left is a limiting value of Riemann sums as the partition size goes to 0. And we know what that gives us. That gives us the definite integral. So here indeed is a reasonable definition of the average value of f on the interval from a to b. It's 1 over b minus a times the integral of f on the interval from a to b. Let's test drive this with a simple function. What is the average value of sine x on the integral from 0 to pi? So in this case, the average value is easy to calculate. The template's really simple. We're going to take 1 over pi minus 0, in other words, 1 over pi, times the integral from 0 to pi of sine x. Fundamental theorem says we need to find an antiderivative of sine, negative cosine, and plug in pi and 0, and you're going to get 2 over pi, or about 0 0.637. Now let's just graph the function sine on the interval from 0 to pi, and we're also going to graph the line y equals 2 over pi, 
And we're going to notice that our wave tank interpretation seems to be reasonable because if you let this water redistribute, the claim is that it should redistribute into this position. And I think that's reasonable. The amount of water that would be peaking up above the red line fills in what shows up below the red line on that interval from zero to pi, and it looks pretty reasonable.